Um, I appreciate it. Uh, I am not a politician. <laughs> I just want to be clear. I am a, a, a law professor, someone who in the nonprofit sector has tried to make our justice system work better for everyone, um, someone who's dedicated their life to training future leaders, uh, and now I am, I am committed to running for the state Supreme Court and try and fix our Supreme Court and make it better. I don't view myself as a politician at all. Um, I, I think that really, uh, I'm happy to be here. I, I do appreciate the fact that in Wisconsin we elect our judges. Um, and I was saying before um, the meeting started uh, to a couple folks, you know, the great thing about electing judges is that um, the candidates have to go out and get votes. And that means they have to go out and meet people around the state. If we appointed our judges, you know, I could just sit in my office at Marquette University, call up Tony Evers and say, hey, Governor Evers, appoint me to the court. And that would be the only person I talked to. But because we elect judges, I go out and I meet with folks, and I meet with folks here in Rock County, and Kewanee County, and Grant County, and I hear their concerns, and then I listen, and when I get elected, and when I go and sit on the bench in Madison, I will be a better judge, because I have listened and heard from the citizens of the state. So I appreciate the fact we elect our judges. But of course, electing judges has challenges. And one of them is, is the voters, like yourselves. You say, well, how do I know what candidate to vote for? How do I know who's a good candidate for judge? Right? I'm not a lawyer. Um, how do I evaluate these people who are running for office? Um, well, let me tell you. I, I'm going to tell you how I think you should think about this and the kind of person we should elect to our state Supreme Court. I'm gonna tell you um, really just one simple message, which is when it comes to our state Supreme Court, diversity matters and diversity makes a difference, okay? Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my background and what that will bring to our seven member Supreme Court, to have someone with that background on the court. And then I'll tell you how that makes a difference. Um, I am, it's true, I'm the son of a Mexican immigrant and a public school teacher. I'm very proud of that fact. Uh, my father was attending a state teacher's college in Pennsylvania. Um, it was called the Indiana State Teacher's College in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I always felt like they didn't know where they were. They subsequently had to change the name because no one could find it. Where in Pennsylvania? <laughs> I think it was Indiana, Pennsylvania. Is, is actually where is that? I'm sorry, I'm I can't tell you. I'm a Pennsylvania boy. So. Oh. I think it was somewhat close to Pittsburgh, is all I can give you, sorry. Uh, but my father, during his, his time studying there, uh, he went with a couple buddies, fellow college students, to Mexico City to do a college sort of study abroad uh, program. And while he was there, one of the other American students said, hey, I heard about a party, you wanna go? My father was always up for a party. He said, sure, I'll go. And his friend said, well, here's the thing, though. I have to go somewhere else first, so I'll meet you there. And the friend gave my father detailed directions to follow. Now, my father never learned a word of Spanish in his life until the day he died. But somehow he followed these directions in Mexico City by streetcar and by bus and by walking. <laughs> he, met, he found his way to this house in a residential area of the city. And you know what I'm going to say. His friend never showed up. <laughs> so my father is there all by himself, doesn't know anyone. For some reason, he gets the courage and he knocks on the door. My mother opened the door. It was her birthday party that he was invited to. And she took pity on this American student who didn't speak Spanish and invited him in. And they talked and they got to know each other. And then he returned to the United States and they wrote letters back and forth every single day and I'm happy to see this is an audience where you know what letters are. Sometimes I have to explain, like texts, but on paper. And then exactly a year later, on my mother's birthday, he returned to Mexico City and they got married. And he brought her back to the United States. They settled in the state of Maryland where they raised four children. I was number two. Um, it was a great love story. Um, they had a great marriage. Um, we were a simple working class family. Uh, teacher's salary, stay at home mom, and money was, you know, we, we did okay, but we certainly didn't have anything like a college savings plan. 
And I discovered that when my older brother Jim went to college. And uh, the savings plan for college was, well, you're going to work and you're going to borrow money. And you're going to hope it doesn't run out. Well, after a year and a half, the money ran out. And my brother had to job, drop out of college. And so I was coming up next in the family and I asked, how am I going to go to college? And the answer was, get a scholarship. And so fortunately, I was talented and I worked hard and I got an academic scholarship that paid my full tuition for my undergrad education and almost all my tuition for law school. And so I was able to get a law degree and graduate and go to work for a national law firm and you know, within my first year, start making three times what my father was making after a career of teaching. But I understood what education can do for families and what education can do to help people move up the economic ladder. And I fully appreciate that. And so I practiced law. Um, I was representing major corporations in the United States. Um, one of my first days at work, I was handed a complaint a loan, our clients just been sued for $350 million. Figure out what we're going to do about it. Um, representing uh, typically large defense contractors, companies that manufacture carrier-based aircraft and cruise missiles. Um, in criminal cases, grand jury investigations, uh, for the kind of cases that you see on the front page of the newspaper. It was uh, great for me financially. Uh, it was very interesting legal work. Um, it did not speak to my soul. That's not how I wanted to spend my life, representing large corporations, uh, and in particular defense contractors. So after four years, four and a half years of this practice, I turned to my wife Heidi and I said, you know what, I want to teach law. I want to give other students the same opportunities that my education gave to me. And to her great credit, my wife Heidi said, yes, let's do it. And we moved to Milwaukee. And for uh, you know, 27 years, I've been on the faculty at Marquette University Law School, teaching constitutional law, criminal law, uh, business law classes, um, and, and training the next generation of lawyers, over 2,300 lawyers, members of the Wisconsin Bar, uh, some of whom are judges. Um, Chelsea Cross is my campaign manager in the back. You probably met Chelsea. Her mother is Judge Danielle Shelton, former student of mine. Um, in fact, I think four of Governor Evers' last appointments to the courts have been former students of mine. Uh, State Representative Evan Boyke in the legislature uh, is a former student of mine, big supporter of my campaign, uh, and many, many other leaders around the state. I'm, I'm probably as proud of the lawyers who are community leaders who have gone on and uh, are head of the Rotary or the United Way in their local community and are making a difference and giving back. Um, but I haven't just been teaching. I've chosen also to give back to working families in our state because I remember how it was growing up in a working family. And so I have led nonprofit organizations that try to assist and help our working families in our state. So one organization I led is the Latino Community Center. Now this was a, a group, um, I became president of the organization, a nonprofit located in one of Milwaukee's worst neighborhoods. Uh, it had the highest teen dropout rate in school. It had the highest teen pregnancy rate in the city of Milwaukee. It had the highest gang activity rate in the city. And I led the organization in purchasing a building. Uh, we put in a kitchen that could serve a free hot meal. We had a computer lab with 14 computers. Uh, we even had a little breakdance stage with uh, sound equipment so the students could learn breakdancing. And after school, every day, we'd have hundreds of kids in that center, supervised, getting homework tutoring, getting a free hot meal, and being safe until their parents could come and pick them up at about 7 p.m. Because these were kids who'd get out of school at 3 p.m. and they were on the street. They were latchkey kids. This was a neighborhood with a lot of single parent homes or homes where there was one parent who was working long hours and the other parent was incarcerated. And these kids were getting in trouble. They were breaking into parked cars. They were engaging in risky sexual activity. They were drifting into gangs. And so we gave them a safe place to be. And in that neighborhood, the kids stayed in school. They didn't drop out and the crime rate went down. 
Another organization I led is called Centro Legal, means legal center in Spanish. And I was president at an early time in that organization when it was getting started. And the idea of that organization is to provide low cost lawyers to working families who have legal problems and would have to go to court on their own without a lawyer because they couldn't afford it if, if they didn't have our assistance. And the client I remember very well was a woman who was married. Um, she didn't speak English very well and one day her husband just disappeared, took off. And after a while she figured he's not coming back. Maybe I should get a divorce. But month to month she'd pay her bills, her rent, her utilities, her groceries, and she never had an extra $200, $500 to hire a divorce lawyer. And so she stayed married because she didn't feel comfortable going to court and trying to get a divorce on her own. Finally, she came to Central Legal. We were able to provide her with legal help at an affordable cost, take her to court, and get her her divorce. And she was able to move on with her life. Another group I helped get started is called the Catholic Charities Legal Services for Immigrants. I was on the board of trustees of Catholic Charities in Milwaukee. A former law student of mine came with me, came to me, she said, I have an idea. I'd like to provide legal services to immigrant families who are facing deportation. I said, let's bring this to Catholic Charities, let's make this happen. Um, these are families that have a legal claim to stay in the United States, right? These are families who, for example, fear persecution if they're returned to their home country. And if they can prove their case in immigration court, they get to stay. Or women who know if they get sent back from where they fled, there's an abusive spouse waiting for them. And if they can prove their case, they have a legal right to stay. But we know in the immigration courts, if you show up without a lawyer, you're almost certainly gonna lose. But if you show up with a lawyer, you have a good chance of prevailing. And so this organization, the Legal Services Program for Immigrants, provides affordable lawyers for families in deportation. So these are examples of how I've chosen to spend my time over the last 25 plus years in the nonprofit sector, trying to make sure our justice system works fairly for everyone, trying to make sure at-risk youth don't get sucked into the criminal system and instead that we intervene and keep them out of the criminal justice system in the first place. And that's what I mean when I say diversity matters, diversity makes it. Because we have an election now for the state Supreme Court, and we're choosing who's going to sit in that chair, on that bench. Whose voice and whose perspective do we want on our state Supreme Court? Now we have seven seats. Isn't there room on our court for a constitutional law professor? Someone who understands, has studied our constitutions, both federal and state? Isn't there room on our court for someone who's a criminal defense lawyer, as I represented clients in my career um, in federal grand jury investigations. We have not had a defense lawyer on our court in over 10 years. Plenty of prosecutors. We have three prosecutors. That's great. I love prosecutors. Shouldn't we have a defense lawyer? We don't have anyone on our court who's chosen to spend their career standing shoulder to shoulder with our working families and our vulnerable immigrant communities and understanding what are their needs and how can the system address their needs? Isn't there room for one seat on the court for someone with that experience? And I can tell you, we've had great justices who come to the court from those backgrounds. Probably, in my opinion, our greatest state Supreme Court justice is Justice Shirley Abramson, who just retired. Over four decades, recognized nationally as a leader on our state Supreme Court. What did she do? before she was made a member of our state Supreme Court through an appointment, she was a law professor at UW. She had never been a trial judge. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, an icon on the United States Supreme Court, recognized as one of the most influential lawyers in our country's history. What did she do before she was appointed to the appellate court by President Clinton? She was a law professor. You can go on and on, the number of leading judges on state Supreme Courts, on federal Supreme Court, that came not from being a trial judge, but from other experiences. And in addition, we don't have a single person of color on our state Supreme Court. It's been over 10 years since Justice Lewis Butler was on the court. He was our first African-American 
He lost his reelection. He's the only justice of color we've had in our state's history. I would be the first Latino to serve on our state Supreme Court. We have a state that is increasingly becoming diverse. The fastest growing segment of our population is the Latino population. Shouldn't we have all three branches of our government reflect the people of our state of Wisconsin? So I think you know the message is, let's decide the kind of justice we want. We keep getting told, well, here's who you should vote for. You should vote for a trial judge. You should vote for a prosecutor who spent their life trying to put people behind bars. I'm not saying that that's uh, the wrong kind of judge. I'm just saying that that's not the only kind of judge. I'm saying let's think what's missing, whose voice and perspective is not there, and let's elect someone to represent that perspective. Now, when you talk about diversity, you talk about different perspectives, there's always that nagging voice in the back of the head. Well, that's great, but what about qualifications? My friends, I'm the most qualified candidate in this race. Graduated at the top of my class from one of the top law schools in the country. Practiced law at a national level, major, major cases. Law professor, expert in constitutional law. When Senator Herb Cole was sitting on the Judiciary Committee, preparing to ask questions of nominees to the U.S. Supreme Court. I was among the people he asked for advice as he prepared to question Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan. When I wrote about President Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland to the U.S. Supreme Court and how the Senate was obstructing the nomination contrary to the Constitution by refusing to hold a hearing the Obama White House contacted me and asked me to participate in a nationwide press conference explaining to the media why it was unconstitutional to refuse to hold a hearing. I am regularly sought out for my opinion on constitutional questions and legal questions um, by news organizations in the state, across the country, and even across the world. I am the most qualified person in this race. So what you get is the possibility to elect a justice who brings a different perspective, a different experience, a different understanding to our state Supreme Court, and the most qualified candidate. How can you go wrong? <laughs> so with that, I am Ed Fallone. I appreciate your attention, and I'd be thrilled to answer any questions that you have. Yes? Uh, you brought the subject up that triggered a memory when uh, Garrett was trying to get the Obama <laughs> candidate mm -hmm. to vote on. Uh, I heard talk that it was possible Obama just could have appointed him on recess or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you, is there any qualifications for that in your mind? Um, if the, when the Senate was recessed, he could have just yeah, there, there were some arguments that President Obama could have done a recess appointment. Um, it's, the Senate began operating, especially during the Obama presidency, under different um, parliamentary rules where they claimed they were really never in recess. Um, and so it would have become a constitutional case. Uh, had Obama uh, chosen to go in that route. Um, and, and President Obama, I know um, uh, oftentimes on, on the right or conservative side, uh, pundits would argue that President Obama was overstepping the Constitution. Uh, in my opinion, he actually was very cautious and, and did not want to take any action as president that he thought would create a precedent for ignoring the Constitution. And, and so he sort of played the Merrick Garland game according to the rules. And um, I think, you know, we live in a world where we have norms and traditions. The Constitution is very brief, right? It can famously, it can fit in your suit pocket, mm -hmm. which means that there's not a lot of detail. And we fill in the detail with norms and traditions, the way things have been done for over 250 years. Um, unfortunately, we live in a world where a lot of those norms and traditions are now being ignored or, or breached. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why we have 
um, this sort of never-ending political crisis is, is we don't have detailed instructions. Uh, and so I think it is important to have, I think it's important to have justices on the court who understand the constitutional system at a very detailed level and understand the norms and the traditions and the role they play in making our system work. And, and I think um, it's really unfortunate that uh, the Merrick Garland uh, appointment turned out the way it did. Well, this is an easy question to answer because I've, I've written about it, and you can Google me on the internet and you can find what I said about it. So um, one of the benefits of being a law professor and someone who's been out front on, on issues for 25 years is you have a record, it's there, and uh, I back it up. So what have I said about Citizens United? I think Citizens United is one of the worst United States Supreme Court decisions in recent decades um, for a couple reasons. One, um, it, it takes the idea of speech and extends it to spending. So that spending money in a political race is considered speech to a much further extent than had ever been done previously. It protects people's ability to contribute money in campaigns and it ties the hands of the public in passing campaign finance laws to an extent um, that previously had not existed. Number two, uh, it, it's a bad decision because then it takes this right of speech in spending and it applies it to corporations um, to an extent that never happened before in our nation's history. Um, as, as I like to say, you know, if you go to the Sistine Chapel in Rome and you look at the ceiling and Michelangelo's painting and there's God reaching his finger out and he's touching the finger of Adam to give life to Adam, if you know what I'm talking about. Well, he's touching Adam. He's not touching Exxon. You know, God did not give life to Exxon. Um, and, and certainly our Constitution was not written to extend rights to anything other than natural human beings. That was the whole philosophy of the founders. Um, so what we have here is, is, is a decision that I think used free speech as a Trojan horse. And, and this was a clear um, strategy. Um, I think, I think those who wanted uh, corporations to play a bigger role in our elections figured, well, liberals love free speech. So if we clothe our arguments in terms of we're expanding the right of free speech, then liberals won't know how to react to it. And, and I think they were successful in getting what they wanted. Um, I think there is still room for um, uh, legislatures to regulate campaign spending to a certain degree after Citizens United, maybe not to the extent that existed previously. Um, one of our challenges as a society is sometimes you get a Supreme Court decision and, and there becomes a battle for the hearts and minds of the public. And so one side will say the decision means more than it does and try and convince the public of that. So we have many people who try to argue the ability to regulate campaign finance spending is gone. Well, I think that overstates it. Certainly it's restrictive, um, but uh, I think there is still some constitutional means to regulate campaign spending. Um, and I think uh, we as a society need to look at that. So thank you for your question. Yes? This might be kind of related to the last question, but like um, the, these groups are tax exempt, and then um, is there any, the courts ever been taken, um, anything yet? Yeah. Yeah, political groups, they're giving all this stuff and then, yeah. I don't know. Well, I think, I think, when you talk about tax exempt, who pays taxes, who doesn't? Um, it's not a constitutional question by and large, right? I mean, constitution is, is not, um, it doesn't take a side on who should pay taxes. So it's left to the legislature. And, and we have tax laws that are notoriously complicated and they do set a standard if you're going to be tax exempt you're supposed to avoid partisan political activity. You're supposed to focus on education and sort of general issues. Well, that standard, of course, has to be enforced. And so I think the real issue is enforcement. And, and it's not a court issue. It's not a legal issue. It's whether or not we have 
uh, a particular presidential administration that's willing to have the IRS devote the time and the resources to actually punish groups that violate the standards. And it's incredible to me, this is not a legal issue, so it has nothing to do with the kind of justice I'll be. It is incredible to me to see how lax the enforcement of the tax code is. Fewer and fewer individuals get audited, and, and next to no advocacy groups get audited. They just don't enforce it. Why? Boy, you want the cynical answer? Um, <laughs> yeah, the cynical answer is both, both sides in the political debate think they have an advantage under the current system. That both sides think that they would rather uh, be able to use these advocacy groups as, as a way of, um, gee, I almost said laundering money. It's not laundering money, but it's a way of funneling political uh, mm, support and contributions uh, to where individual human beings don't have to get associated with it. Both sides think it benefits them. That would be my answer. So I wish I could give you a better answer. Um, but you know, let, let me say this. Let me say this about, about politics. Um, I am the candidate in this race who is devoted to running a campaign that is not partisan, okay? I think we all share an interest in making sure our political elections are not run like judicial elections and judicial elections are not run like political elections. I'm not gonna run attack ads, um, lobbying personal charges against my opponents. I'm not going to try and politicize this election uh, and say, you know, my opponent is backed by Trump or whatever, because I don't think that's how we should have our judicial elections decided. Um, I think that when the public views judge candidates behaving the same as congressional candidates or gubernatorial candidates or any other politician, then they lose faith that our judges are actually independent and impartial. And so I think there's a real connection between how candidates run their campaigns and how the public views our judges. And I think one reason why we're so dissatisfied with our state Supreme Court is that they have deviated from that and they have run partisan campaigns. And you know, the incumbent, Daniel Kelly, who I'm running against, his election headquarters or campaign headquarters is located in the state Republican Party headquarters. Ooh. Ooh. So, I mean, how can you run a campaign that way, and then once you get elected, tell the voters, oh, I'm impartial, okay? I've gone out, I've hired Chelsea Cross, other staff, complete independent staff, funding my campaign. I'll take contributions from everyone. I'm happy if you're a progressive. I'm happy if you're an independent. I'll take your money if you're a Republican, trust me. But I'm running an independent campaign, and I'm running a nonpartisan campaign. Um, well, usually what happens is either your state that elects their judges, in which case typically they're nonpartisan positions, or your state where the judges are appointed, and there's not a ballot, so there's no Democrat or Republican, but if you're appointed, you're pretty much it's clear what side you're on. Um, there's arguments for both. I understand. Some people think because of the way money gets into elections, it might be better to have an appointment process. But I think, you know, then it's still political. It's just it all happens behind the scenes. Um, I tend towards thinking elections are better, even though it's challenging. Let me tell you, as a candidate, um, to try and run a nonpartisan race, it, it is a challenge. Yes? <laughs> you raised an interesting question, and I'm wondering, has Trump indicated anything in Wisconsin? Is he at all interested in our state Supreme Court, do you know? Uh, well, I haven't checked his Twitter feed lately. Um, <laughs> my, I don't think he has made any indication as of this moment that he's interested <gasps> in the race. I fully expect that after the primary, February 18th, vote at Falone, I fully expect that after the primary, 
um, he will weigh in because Wisconsin is the key battleground state in November. Mm -hmm. So once we get focused on the April 7th election, that's the dry run. And so I think the Democratic Party and the Republican Party and President Trump will view our April Supreme Court race and any other issues on the ballot in April as a dry run to get ready for the real, real November presidential. And so they will care. Just for clarification, if, if one candidate wins by more than 50 percent in the original first election, is there still another election, or is that, is that it? Yes, there's a, the primary just narrows the field to two. Right, and I'm saying, okay, so if there's three and one wins clear, they still there's, have the second one. Absolutely, exactly. absolutely. There's no, there's no system where uh, someone who wins the primary by a higher threshold. Um, well, sometimes it's over 50 percent. That, that can be in, in different offices. In other places, they may yeah. call right, but not this one. So the incumbent, if the incumbent would come in third, would be out of the race? Is Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you can hope for that. It's not going to happen. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I get a lot of folks um, who, uh, who tell me that they're having a difficult time deciding in, in the Supreme Court race. Um, I don't know why, I think clearly I'm the most qualified candidate. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's fair to say that, that Daniel Kelly, the incumbent who was appointed by Governor Walker three years ago, he's now seeking a full 10 year term. Um, I think it's fair to say that he will be one of the top two vote getters. And I'll be the other. I tell you that um our granddaughter <clears throat> turned 18 on the 29th of December, and the first thing she, that was a Sunday, mm -hmm. the first thing she wanted to do on Monday was register to vote. Well, I applaud. I and applaud she that. is going to vote, and she said, take notes tonight because she wants to know all about this. So. Oh, well, great. well, we have video. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, 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 this is a great organization. It's, it's the Rock, Rock County Progressives, right? Mm -hmm. um, the word progressive, has a very um, a wonderful tradition in our country and in our state, as, as you know. And, and to my mind, um, the real core meaning of progressive is, is the belief that the more people who vote and have a participation in selecting our government, the more legitimate government is. I mean, to me, that's what progressive means. And so when we talk about things like gerrymandering, voter ID, I mean, to my mind, these, these threaten the core values of any progressive because it would limit the number of people who get to participate in you know, the laws that we live under and that limits the number of people whose voice is heard. If you go back to the start of the progressive movement, I think it was all about expanding the number of people who have a role. Um, and that's, that's one of the sad things about our time because if you believe greater participation means more legitimate government, then that seriously, we, we have a, a real question about legitimacy right now. Yes? So that was almost my question. <laughs> um, right now, it's a pretty conservative court. Yes. Do you agree with that? Absolutely, five to two. So you're gonna be, you're gonna have a tough time swaying the court Let, let me let me push back on that, okay. because um, I'm the candidate who's, who's running a nonpartisan race here. I am not attacking anyone, um, demonizing anyone, and I'm not demonizing the conservative majority currently on the court. I'm not sure how a candidate for the state Supreme Court can expect to run a campaign lobbing accusations against five sitting members of the court and expect if they win, to be able to work with those people. Mm -hmm. um, I know all the justices on the court. As a law professor at Marquette Law School, I've met them all, socialized with them at different functions. Um, they know me, I know them. And they know that over 25 years, speaking out and writing on legal issues, criticizing our state Supreme Court for some of their decisions, Act 10 decision, the, uh, the lame duck decision that recently came out, yeah. I'm, perfectly, I'm perfectly comfortable telling them 
why they were wrong, but I've never accused them of bad faith. I've never accused them of, of any sort of you know, personal uh, fault or failure. Um, and so I think I can reach across the divide and find common ground. And, and one thing is that I've always stood for principles, right? Not outcomes, but principles. Equal protection under the law. Everyone is entitled to fair treatment because that's what the Constitution says. Everyone's entitled to the same treatment unless the go government can meet a very high standard of justifying differing treatment. Um, the right of self-government. Well, that's in the Constitution. That's number one in terms of why we have a Constitution. So I have fought for principles, and if I can convince a conservative justice that these principles are threatened, I can maybe convince them, you know what? Let's agree on an outcome that uh, advances these basic principles that you and I agree on. Um, I think that I can be uh, a justice who can uh, bridge the divide. Uh, I honestly do. Not on every case, but I think uh, more likely than, than any of the other candidates. Do you believe in the death penalty? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, we don't have the death penalty in Wisconsin. Um, it's not going to come before the court. It would be very easy then for me to dodge the question. Um, I don't dodge questions. Uh, this is why I'm not a politician. Um, I think that or morally, uh, based on my religious principles, I do not believe a government should ever put anyone to death. That's a, just a personal view. However, as a constitutional law scholar, we have the fact that at the time the Constitution, the Eighth Amendment, was adopted, um, we had not only the death penalty as the most common criminal penalty, but we also had a variety of other horrible treatments of, of prisoners. So if you ask, you know, in our constitutional system, uh, was the death penalty meant to be off limits, I think any fair examination would say, well, no. Our Supreme Court has said, well, we have to look at evolving standards under the death penalty, the Eighth Amendment, what was cruel and unusual in 1789, uh, you know, is not the same thing as what's cruel and unusual today. I understand that. The court has consistently uh, shrunk the instances where the death penalty is allowed under the Constitution, but there is still an area where it is permitted under current law. And um, unless and until the US Supreme Court decides to abolish it, as a state Supreme Court justice, if it were ever to come up in Wisconsin, um, I would have to recognize um, it, didn't, it didn't contravene the Constitution. He doesn't believe in it. Well, not personally. I have a lot of things I don't personally believe in. Look, let me just say this, right? Uh, <laughs> We know you're either, it's okay. My, no, my, my primary value is that we get to govern ourselves, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, when, uh, when we had our revolution from England, uh, it wasn't no taxation. We're free, we have a right not to be taxed. That wasn't the cry. It was no taxation without representation. It was because the tax laws were passed without our voice being heard, that was the objection. And it comes from the idea that we govern ourselves, not someone else. Now, if I believe that as our core principle, if the legislature validly passes a law that's not in conflict with our basic constitutional rights, even if I don't like it, my core value is we govern ourselves. So I would feel obligated. The right of self-government means, as a judge, I must respect the will of the majority, unless it contravenes our constitutional core rights. And so when I talk about, you know, well, I don't think the death penalty violates that constitutional core, then even if I don't like it, I would have to respect that result. Because I think it's more important to uphold our right of self-government. Yes, sir. Do you consider the Wisconsin legislature to represent the majority? Well, now, that's, that's a question about gerrymandering. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, we have the census coming up. After the census is done, the Wisconsin legislature will draw up new legislative maps. Um, I'm sure they will gerrymander the heck out of them. It'll go to Governor Evers to sign. Maybe he'll veto them and they might override the veto. Maybe there'll be some negotiation where they back off a little bit and he agrees to sign. Somehow or other, we'll get new legislative districts. The day after that happens, a lawsuit's gonna get filed. It'll be filed by the ACLU and the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin, because that's who challenged these cases. And it will go on a fast track to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Um, I can't comment on how I would rule in that case because I want to be on the court and I want to be able to rule on that case. And if I express a clear opinion one way or the other, I will be asked to recuse myself uh, as having already made up my mind. And I think it's important to have an open mind and to be honest, while I can absolutely predict who's gonna file the lawsuit, I can't predict exactly what their legal arguments are gonna be. And so I should have an open mind. But even though I'm not gonna comment any further on that question, I've already talked about my core value under the Constitution, which is that we all have a basic right to participate in the making of the laws we live under. And I cannot foresee uh, voting to uphold any law that undermines that basic principle. Um, I admire your nonpartisan stance, and I totally understand why you're taking it. What do you say to people who are worried that in a polarized setting, that'll mean you're less likely to get elected? I get it. I mean, that's what we hear from people. That's why supposedly the last person who ran, the woman who ran, didn't get elected in part. Um, and I sort of add in there, I think you're also smart for not running attack ads, even if politically, because I've heard there the attack ads in that instance actually backfired and called out the base of the other side. So yeah. in any event, what, what do you say to that? Um, well, I say, I say two things in response. One is um, I'm absolutely being honest when I say that um, having judicial candidates behave like political candidates is bad for all of us because then the public just views courts as political bodies. Well, all courts have, right? The only way they can, can enforce or influence us is, is if we go along with what they say. They don't have a police force. They don't have an army. They're not gonna force us to follow their decisions and live our lives according to their decisions. We just do it because we trust, well, that must be what the law says. And if we stop believing that's what the law says and we start thinking, well, this is just a political declaration, then maybe we don't listen to them anymore. I mean, that's when we talk about the legitimacy of the courts. This is what we talk about. The other question is, is more a tactical one, which is, you know, that's and, you know I guess, you know, maybe I'd rephrase it, can a good guy win? <laughs> um, I am very clear. Um, I think I'll win if I talk about my principles and my values, and not just in kind of this vague, I, I, I believe in treating people fairly, but in terms of, no, our Constitution guarantees all of us equal treatment under the law unless the government has a really good reason to treat us differently, and that's why it's wrong for businesses to discriminate against gay and lesbian customers, right? And that's why um, you know, it's wrong to ban people from entering the U.S. just because of their religious faith. Um, so I think I can energize voters to support my campaign if I can explain to them, these are the basic principles I have fought for my entire career. And this is not new. It's not like I say, oh, I'm going to run for the Supreme Court. I better find something to believe in. Um, it's amazing to me. We put on my website, aloneforjustice.com, there's actually a tab, Writings. Click on it. You get everything I've written over 25 years about Act 10, the Trump Muslim ban when Governor Walker tried to charge fees for the right to protest. Um, it's all there. Opinion pieces I wrote um, about um, 
you know, why it was wrong for Marquette University to refuse to hire a lesbian employee because they said uh, she didn't reflect the, uh, the image they wanted to project. It's all there. So I absolutely believe if I simply state my principles that I have fought for, I will energize voters to come out. And sometimes people say, well, but that's partisan, right? I say, no, it's not partisan. Because how can I swear to uphold the Constitution if I don't defend equal protection? Because that's in the Constitution. How can I uh, swear to uphold the Constitution if I don't defend the right to vote? Because we have a constitutional right to vote. <laughs> so for me, it's not about partisanship. It's about just explaining, this is what I fought for in my whole career. Um, I, I think actually that's the right answer, in my opinion. It's not, there's a difference, and I would say what you're putting forward right, is your progressive values. You don't use that word progressive, not everyone sees it the same way we do, mm -hmm. but essentially that's what's winning these days. I mean, yeah. people are ready, I think, for a progressive alternative. Yeah. And when they hear that, that's going to bring them out. And, and as you said, that's not partisan. That's, that's different. Not, right? not at all. Right. That's Absolutely. Putting your values forward. I agree. So thank you for agreeing that that's the best answer. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, there's been, uh, just now this week, I think it was, yeah, reading some more where they're um, promoting another round of voter suppression. Mm -hmm. The uh, not people <coughs> on the voter roll. Yeah. Do you uh, have any insights into what's going on there or how that should, should get handled in the courts? Well, I'll tell you what the, how I view the two opposing legal arguments, if you like. Um, I don't think I'm in a position to, um, to tell you which of the two I think is correct, because the case is ongoing, and to be honest, I'm running around the state. I haven't read the briefs. <laughs> so I don't think it's fair for me to, to say which of the two arguments um, I think is correct. But I can tell you the two arguments one, on the one hand, we have um, a state law. So this is to knock people off the voter registration because? There's evidence they may have moved, and they have conflicting records in the state system as to what your home address is. Um, and this is a, something that happens. I mean, people move. They're no longer eligible to vote at their old <coughs> address. And they just haven't updated their voter registration. And so there is probably about 32 states that participate in a program that helps the states identify voters who have two different addresses. And uh, then there's a process, they call it a purge, which is, that's the word they use. It's not a great word. Um, but then there's a process where the state attempts to contact the individual and say, hey, we have two different addresses. Which one is it? And then you have some people who reply and some people who don't. And the current law requires uh, that if there's not a reply, that individual gets dropped from the voting rolls. So you have a law that seems pretty straightforward. Um, and it doesn't seem on its face to be partisan. It's a real question. We don't know where this person lives. OK, well, that would suggest this is proper. And this is something that happens every year. So it's not like uh, it just happened. On the other side, that law the way it's written, it's not clear that it applies to the Wisconsin Elections Commission. And you may recall a few years ago, um, we changed the whole system of who oversees elections. We used to have the Government Accountability Board, and then Governor, Governor Walker, apparently Republicans felt the Government Accountability Board had become too much siding with Democrats, so they decided to abolish it, and they created this new Wisconsin Elections Commission which now has three members that are Democrats, three that are Republicans. Somehow they think that's going to lead to them working together. In any event, it was created. Now it oversees voting roles. But the law about purges was written beforehand, and it doesn't seem to actually reference the Wisconsin Elections Commission. You have a law that tells an organization that no longer exists that it has to purge it doesn't necessarily apply, maybe, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. It doesn't clearly apply to the Wisconsin Elections Commission. So uh, one of the parties opposing the purge says, 
you know, they sued the Wisconsin Elections Commission demanding they purge the rolls. It's not their job to purge because the law doesn't apply to them. Those are the two arguments, and they, I think they both have, have validity. Um, and I don't know enough at this stage to, to tell you which I think is right. But I think they're both valid arguments at this stage. Yes? It's very difficult <clears throat> to change your address if you are no longer paying a water bill, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, our family moved. My husband and I are both on the water bill. Yeah. Our son who had become disabled is living with us, an adult. Brought in a medical bill okay. addressing them. That didn't, no, no medical bills are no good. It had to be a it's utility? It's got to be a utility bill. But okay, he's not paying utilities, he's mm -hmm. living with us. So, City Hall said, all right, <clears throat> fill out this application, we will send it to you, you will then have to turn around and send it back. Okay, fine, perfect. It's okay, I'm always trying to save postage, right? I'm going by the city hall, <clears throat> they have a drop box. So I called and I said, instead of putting this in the mail, can I put it in your drop box? No, it's got to be postmarked, that's the law. I mean, it's just these little yeah. intricacies, Yeah that will make it difficult for people who don't know us. Yeah. Or if someone hasn't voted for a few years and they decide to vote. That's right. Know, there could be no sinister problem yeah. there. Um, I agree 100% uh, with, with what you're pointing out. And as I said, I, I mean, for me, when I hear the word progressive, I think belief in expanding the vote to as many people as possible. So I actually you know, absolutely agree with you. Um, there is, of course, in Wisconsin, the option of registering the day of voting mm -hmm. at the polls. It can be challenging because then you show up to register the same day, but they say, no, you need a utility bill, you go back, and you may have to do multiple trips, and it's not perfect. Um, is this the system I would create? No, it's not even close to the system I would create. Um, I'm not 100% I'm not sure that it is violation of the constitutional right to vote if it's just difficult at that stage. Now, I went through the whole voter ID. You can go to falloneforjustice.com. You can see what I said about the voter ID law. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I did is I pointed out, um, you know, it needed a, a waiver for people who couldn't afford to pay for an ID. They couldn't be forced to forfeit the right to vote because of an inability to pay. Um, that became a basis for one of the legal challenges. One of the litigants picked up that argument, took it to the state Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court agreed. Yes, you can't charge people for the right to vote, but then, this I didn't foresee, uh, the majority of the court rewrote the law themselves to create a fee waiver, which I never imagined in a million years that justices would say, well, We'll just say the law is constitutional as long as it has this fee waiver and we just say it does. So, um, not the kind of system I would write. Um, probably not enough in and of itself to violate the constitutional right to vote as long as you have same day registration without proof that the same day registration is just too onerous. That would be my response to your situation. Not happy about it. Not happy about it. Um, <clears throat> with the whole Mary Garland thing and the whole Republicans just violating norms all over the place, I mean, that really feels like de facto slave market rule. It's kind of scary in a lot of ways. And then on top of that, I mean, I'm kind of angry at Obama for not pushing more appointments through. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you have Trump ramming him through, and Republicans ramming him through, and yeah. just, which is scary. I mean, sometimes. You hear people say, well, maybe we should just pack the courts. And I must say, that sounds like, I mean, assuming we got complete control over everything, that's yeah. tempting. I can see from your expression, you're probably, you're probably not happy with that part. I'm beginning to think there's no alternative, that we should either pack them or we should impeach them. I mean, one way or the other, because yeah. it's ridiculous. Um, 
you know, the, the difficulty with being principled and saying we shouldn't treat judges like a political prize to be won by one party, the difficult with having principles like that is you have to apply them to yourself too. Um, I think, yes, uh, what President Obama didn't realize was that once Trump was elected, they would eliminate the filibuster so that there was no way for the minority party to prevent federal judges from getting appointed. But moreover, um, what happened, and, and this is something I think the general public doesn't understand is happening, but I heard it from the, the horse's mouth. I mean, one of the advisors to the Trump administration on judicial appointments gave a talk at the Federalist Society meeting in Milwaukee, probably thinking, oh, these are all Federalist Society people, no one's gonna leave this room and repeat it, but I was there, because <laughs> I wanted to hear what he had to say. And, and what he said was astounding. What he said was, traditionally, when federal judges get appoint, appointed, there were two criteria that you looked at. The quality of their legal education, what law school they went to, how they did, and the quality of their legal experience. And then he said, under the Trump administration, I'm happy to say that the main qualification we use to recommend people for appointment is how loyal a Federalist Society member they are. And so it doesn't matter, and he said this, it doesn't matter what law school you went to or what your grades were. And it doesn't matter what kind of legal work you did or if you ever did any legal work after you graduated. All that matters is how loyal a Federalist Society member you are. And that gets you appointed to a lifetime as a federal judge. That, I think, is our true, true problem. Um, and, uh, and age. Well, yeah, they want them to be young. young. They want them to be young, but but old enough to have demonstrated their loyalty as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can only be elected and fix that problem, right? I mean, it's legal what they're doing. Yes, uh, I think the only fix is a different president, because that's the power of appointment, and 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 perhaps and perhaps uh, get a majority in the Senate and reinstitute. The filibuster, although maybe wait until wait until a, a lot of judges get appointed who are more progressive, and then reinstitute the filibuster. Let them all in before you close the door. I don't know. I don't know. But certainly, it starts with a, a change at the presidential level. I, you know, you said that we go with a lot of questions, and I thought, oh, there won't be more than 10, 15 minutes of questions. <laughs> no, you have, you have great questions. You've got a lot of questions, so I appreciate that. We think, that's why. <laughs> sure. Um, so the Senate is, you talk about packing a court, one way to pack a court would be to divide California up so they have six senators instead of two, because they have such a huge population properly representative, of course this is a constitutional thing that every state has two mm -hmm. senators. Yeah. Is that written in stone? Can that be changed? Uh, I don't see a way to, um, without amending the Constitution. So 300 people in Idaho have as much representation as yeah. all these people in California. Yeah, I know. Well, that's the Constitution has some anti-democratic aspects, huh. and, and that's one of them. In fact, um, just an aside, um, you know, I, I am a big student of history, and I love reading American history, and one of my favorite authors is Gary Wills, who's written you know, uh, Lincoln at Gettysburg, who won the Pulitzer Prize for that, and a series of other. Anyway, one of my heroes, I happened to get to meet him, invite him to Marquette Law School to give a talk, and he came and he gave a talk, and, and I was expecting this very staid, old, conservative historian type. And he's old, but he sat there and he said to me and to everyone assembled, uh, yeah, the Constitution is, is anti-democratic, and what we need to do is take to the streets and get change that way. <laughs> wow, <laughs> I was not expecting that. <laughs> um, be for a college class, though. <laughs> well, yeah, um, but, um, I think we, we do have to recognize the Constitution uh, was created with a healthy dose of um, fear 
of the general public exercising political power and trying to limit political power to some sort of political elite. There's no denying that. Um, aspects of it have been made more democratic over our history. It used to be that the um, state legislatures chose senators, and then we amended the Constitution so that we get to choose senators, not the state legislatures. So, it, and we've extended the vote to women and African Americans, right? So, it has been made more democratic, but we still have some vestiges left of that early fear of popular democracy, and yes, um, having the same number of senators for every state, regardless of population, is one of those. Um, should that be changed in the future through a constitutional amendment? I usually don't talk about constitutional amendments because my fear is when you open up an amendment for one thing, you can't stop people proposing all kinds of other things. Mm -hmm. And I'm more afraid of what we don't know coming out in a convention uh, than I am of any particular specifics. Uh, I'm better off pushing for statehood for DC when the Democrats take over. They better do that. Because there, there's where you get control of the Senate. And Puerto Rico. <laughs> and Puerto Rico, absolutely. Yeah, so <clears throat> other ways. All right, we're getting close to uh, to the end point. Maybe we should take one more question, if there's one more. I'm also starting to get a little worn out. I always tell Chelsea, you know, like, you'll come save me sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> if the questions go on for an hour, at some point, Chelsea. I'm about to call it. <laughs> <laughs> see if there's questions. Yeah, is there, I can take one more if anyone has one. Otherwise. What law school did you go to? I went to Boston University School of Law. <coughs> which is consistently ranked in the top 25 law schools in the country. Um, and uh, the great thing about it, um, when I was there, I was there in the late 80s, that's how old I am, um, it's actually um, across the river from Harvard Law School. And at that time, Harvard would mandatorily